Welcome back to The Pulse. If you just joined, you can uh, join us uh, via all our social media handles. It's on Joy News on TV. You can tweet at us with the hashtag The Pulse. Now, President Ekofuad uh, completes his leadership of the NPP when his two-year term of office in 2024. Uh, before this time, his successor should have been selected by the party's members at Congress. The race continues to take shape as the days go by, with Trade Minister Alan Sherman Singh and Vice President Dr. Mamadou Baumia, uh, the front runners for the job. While the two men have directly not voiced out their desire for the job, they have not been able to hide it from the public either, with their supporters conducting underground campaigns. It is now the anger of some of the supporters which has given rise to concerns that the contest may not be fair. Is that indeed the case? This afternoon we have brought together experts and party supporters to discuss the push for NPP leadership and what will be required to conduct a smooth process that also energizes the party's grassroots for victory in the next elections. Let's start with some of the concerns. Since the release of the rules and regulations, a number of high-profile and ranking members of the party have openly violated the rules and regulations by declaring their support for the Vice President, His Excellency Dr. Alhaji Mahmoud Baumia, who has left nobody in doubt of his ambition to become the party's presidential candidate. Prominent among these party officials who have blatantly violated the party's rules and regulations are as follows. Deputy General Secretary of the party, Nana Obri Bwahin, the Northern Regional Executives led by Chairman Samba, the Vice Chairman of Ashanti, Mr. Kobran Senchire, the Member of Parliament for Karaga, my own friend and former colleague, Amin Anta, and then Member of Parliament for Toron, Honorable Habib Idrisu, and Farouk Mahama, MP for Yendi, among others. Interestingly, even though the actions of the above mentioned officials and senior members clearly violate the party's code of conduct, none of these blatant violators has been called to order by the national executives of the party. The worst of it all, at the recent National Delegate Conference of the party, which was held in Kumasi, no less a person than the Vice President himself, Alaji Dr. Mahmoud Mamia, who was part of the very body that promulgated the party's rules and regulations in wanton disregard of the same rules and regulations, arrived at the conference ground with supporters wearing his branded T-shirts and banners announcing his campaign for the flag bearership. As if breaching the code of conduct wasn't embarrassing, the vice president and his cohort, in their desperation, went on as far as breaching the state protocol as he and his followers arrived late to the function, well ahead, well after His Excellency, the president, Anado Dankwa Ekufado, and the first lady had taken their seats. In spite of all this embarrassing conduct, nobody in the national executive, including Mr. John Bodu, the general secretary, who announced the sanctions, has come out to condemn it or say anything about it. However, in an animal farm selective justice faction, when supporters of other aspirants, particularly Honorable Alan John Kujo Martin, a founding member of the party, try to stand their ground and protect their own, they are either immediately rounded up by security agencies or subjected to acts of intimidation and senseless suspension. A clear case in point is the arrest and detention of some supporters of Honorable Alan Chamartin, the Minister for Trade and Industry, and a leading contender to the flag bearership at the just-ended National Delegate Conference for protesting the flagrant abuse of the party's regulations. Things are really falling apart in MPP of today. Our fear, ladies and gentlemen, is that if current situation is not arrested and every member of the party made to feel an equal member with equal opportunities, 
the party would face an ignominious defeat in 2004 with grave consequences into the future. We want to use this medium to appeal to His Excellency Nana Dodan Kwekufuado, His Excellency J. Kufo, the former president, and other leading personalities, including Mr. Kojo Pienin or Safu Mafo. As disappointing as it may sound, the three people, namely Abdul Rahman Dauda, Khalib, and Mustafa, who have been punished by way of suspension for allegedly supporting Honorable Alan Shermatin, were never taken through the above stipulated procedures as issued by the party on July 27, 2021. To the astonishment of the party grassroots, ladies and gentlemen, Alaj Mohammed Bantima. Samba, Honorable Habib Idrisu, Honorable Farouk Mohammed, Honorable Amin Anta, and lawyer Nana Obri Boye have, uh, not forgetting Kwabna Sentry, have all breached the party's code of conduct with impunity. But the party's top hierarchy has kept mute, surprisingly. That we find so worrying and raising much suspicion going forward. Abundant evidence available gives a clear verdict that the party's application of the code of conduct issued by the national executives have proven, uh, have proven beyond reasonable doubt to be selective and abusive. Let's now broaden the conversation and speak with Christian Daniel Dugan, who is former Deputy Minister for Fisheries under the Kofor administration. Dr. Asasante is Senior Lecturer, Political Science Department and Director of the Center for European Studies at the University of Ghana. I'm also joined by Eric Osei, who is convener of the Ashanti Patriots Movement. Dr. Kobi Mensa is a political communication strategist with the University of Ghana Business School. And Dr. Ali Dusedo is also a senior lecturer at the Department of Political and uh, Political Science Department at the University of Ghana. I'm extremely grateful, gentlemen, for your time uh, this afternoon. I want to start with an article that has been widely circulated, written by a member of the MPP, George Krobi Asante, except which reads, the party's disappointing performance in the 2020 general elections, which culminated in the loss of our parliamentary majority status, is ample proof that all is not well with our dear party. How does the current happenings in the NPP come across to you? Uh, Dr. Sassanti, I'll start with you. Good afternoon, Aisha, and good afternoon to your viewers. Um, I think he has hit the nail right on the head. The last election, even though MPP won, they struggled to do so. Because if you look at it from previous elections, you realize that that was a difficult one because of a lot of factors. But um, we are surprised uh, as to the turn of events now. Because if you look at even this government, which is a little, um, is about more than one year now, uh, the government is uh, having a lot of challenges. One would have expected the party to be united at this time, to be able to forge ahead, work, and uh, support the party to champion its cause. But of course, this concerns also um, is an ample testimony uh, that uh, there are a lot that the party need to do in order to make sure that they place themselves in the right a position to fight the battle of 2024. Um, it is a very, very uh, difficult task for them now, but they need to be able to uh, look at the best way to handle it so that people don't feel pain, so that people don't feel isolated within a party that they call their own, that they want to be associated with all the time. So it's a whole gamut of um, issues that they need to handle and handle it carefully. Now, uh, Dr. Ali Risedo, what's your own reading of the current situation uh, in the NPP? Dr. Ali Risedo? All right, so if we don't uh, have- Thank you, Aisha. I think there have been a lot of uh, accusations and counter accusations uh, about the level of fair playing field that has been given to potential aspirants that want to succeed 
the president as flag bearer in the 2024 elections. Mm. And I think all the press conferences that we have listened to have been able to cite concrete examples to back the claims that they are making. And I think the last time the party reacted to it was, I think yesterday, when the general secretary spoke to one of the press conferences. And I think he didn't dispute the fact that these things has actually happened and the people who have been punished have been supporting one of the potential flag bearers and not the other. What he just said was that the party's laws will be strictly applied. And I think we, they have to move beyond just words to be able to put this into action. To be honest with you, victory is seriously a requirement for the success of the MPP in 2024. And like my colleague, uh, Dr. Asa Asante mentioned, even with a united front and being in government, last year was a, a struggling victory for the MPP. So if the party is not able to maintain that unity and move into 2024, it's going to be very difficult for them. And the MPP must be guided by history. They have lost elections that they were supposed to win simply because of disagreement and the lack of unity. So moving forward, the level at which internal democracy is dipping in this country, the national democratic dispensation and consolidation. So I think if you are able to put your house into order, you don't have the right to speak to national issues when the same rules are applied to you as a political party uh, in the major election. So I think appropriate steps must be taken in a reassuring manner to let everybody know that an equal playing field will be, will be provided for all potential uh, flag bearers who want to, potential flag bearers who want to uh, uh, succeed the president, so that they will have a very free, fair, transparent, democratic process. And that can build unity in the party and rally all the other candidates behind the winning candidate, so that 2024 will be a very solid, uh, comprehensive, holistic campaign structure for the MPP. Uh, Dr. Kobe Mensa, what does this mean in terms of branding and marketing, I mean, uh, for MPP 2024? Thank you, Aisha, and uh, hello to my colleagues. Um, uh, obviously, that is a very terrible situation to be in, especially coming from a, a party that is known as a due process you know, party. And uh, we just recently published a paper uh, that actually looked at, you know, uh, the relationships you know, within political parties. Internal wranglings is one of the key issues that actually happen to political parties all over the world. But that is one of the key issues that actually take parties to a position. I mean, obviously, corruption <laughs> next is uh, unfulfilled promises, and next is open lines. But one of the key things is internal wranglings actually sent a lot of political parties from government to a position. So clearly, it is something that is a dent on a party that claims due process because clearly people are actually saying that that due process is not happening. You seem to be, you know, cracking the whip, you know, on one side, but not the other. And the party's response, as uh, Dr. Ali Dissedi actually mentioned, you know, wasn't that enough to prove that indeed they have been fair in the, in the, in the approach that they are taking. So it's a very serious case for the MPP. Uh, and then of course, they should understand that agency, you know, uh, theory actually happens in political parties. You can actually argue that, yes, uh, the vice president hasn't actually declared that he wants to contest. You can argue that, you know, uh, Honorable Alan Chomantin hasn't actually declared that he's contested. You can argue that Boache Jacques hadn't declared. But of course, agency, you know, you have the agents, you know, uh, coming out and then demonstrating that indeed the intent. And the vice president hadn't actually you know, disproved it. He, he had actually gone on to put up action that suggests that indeed he's contested. Have you taken any action against his supporters or him? No. Of course, you have actually taken action against, you know, Honorable Alan Chamantin's, you know, supporters. So I think that is very, very difficult, you know, to understand. And I'm sure the voters are actually looking at it and they're thinking, well, this is a party that calls itself due process political party. Uh, thankfully, I have two members of the NPP on this uh, panel for the conversation. Uh, Mr. Dugan is a former deputy minister under the Kofa administration. Mr. Dugan, you are a member of the NPP. Are you worried about the recent developments? Yeah, I'm very, very worried. Terribly worried because um, if you belong to a party, that is your all. You are born into that tradition. 
And you want to see the party progress. No matter what position you are giving the party, you just want the party to progress. Because our tradition is a kind of tradition which I believe, given the chance, we can transform this country. But however, if we have this kind of things going on, where there's a selective justice, where there's a something called something I'll call elitism. And when I say elitism here, I'm not saying that um, it's wrong being an elite, but elitism in the sense that uh, what they call it, uh, exclusiveness and snobbishness. That is being exhibited by some members of the party, especially the national executive. Then there's cause to worry. The cause to worry centers on the fact that the United Gold Coast Convention, UGCC, was formed in 1947, I believe. But by 1952, it was disbanded because of elect, uh, electism. You know, the, the, the top hierarchy of the party were not regarding the youth and, uh, and the communists. And they all moved with Nkrumah into the CPP. Now you see, rules have been set. And I heard the, the honorable um, the professor also saying that this party is known to adhere to rule of law. This is our kind of democracy. Now when you set the rules and then you look one way, whilst other people are flouting that rule or the rules, but then you tend to suspend or punish others when they also flaunt the rules, then you are creating problems for the party. Now, may I continue? And um, I'm so sad about the way the General Secretary, John Buedo, is uh, doing his things. He said the rules, but then he made a statement that Umuni Baumia, Baumia's father, was key in the formation and the history of the United Party. This is a big lie. He shouldn't have even mentioned Bamiya's name, uh, Mumuni Bamiya's name. Then a lady from the Jubilee House called Teresa at a public function introduced Bamiya as the incoming president. Nothing was done to her. Honorable Habib Ijusu, Toron, uh, and uh, Honorable Omar Ali Mahama openly campaign for Baumia, nothing has been done. John Buedo came, I think yesterday or the day before yesterday, to say that the leader of the Ashanti region group, which spoke against selective justice, was not an MPP member. Well, he was an MPP member, gave up his membership card and stood independent. Okay, so we should go to sleep. Well, and what about those who held the same press conference in the North and in Cape Coast? In fact, the spokesperson for the Kriptos group was a former DC, Samuel Yao Ajay Kesi. Uh, Ajay B. Kesi, sorry. Now, we, we, have, we have suspended at least three members of the party, electoral area coordinators, and then um, police station secretaries and whatnot, for also standing up to campaign for Honorable Alan Martin. What about his, his, um, his deputy, Aubrey Boyle, who said he's going to leave the hand of, so, uh, what they call it, a Mamfusi person to win the, the what they call it, the, the flabbership. All those who we have now been told are interested in standing for the election. Only one person is from Mampusi. If all of them were from Mampusi, I have no problem with the why. Only one of them is from Mampusi and is the vice president. Recently, another person too came and then castigated lies that, uh, what they call it, um, um, Honorable Arantre Martin decided to, to quit the party when he lost to um, what he considered to um, uh, his silence in Anakufadu in 2007. The truth must be told. After Alan conceded and was hoping that the party should unite, people who were perceived to be supporters of Alan 
were being harassed by NDP members. And Alan kept uh, 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 begging the, uh, the national chairman to put this vote to order so that we come together, you see, come together as a family to win the 2008. That never happened. So Alan put up a conditional statement that if this is continuing, he cannot see the NDP losing the election. So it's because of him that certain people were being harassed. So he's going to step aside from the NDP so the NDP can win victory. It was conditional. And then it is really said that he, he did this and he, he decided to quit the party. It was conditional. Now, um, John Buedu is now asking Alan to distance himself from comments made by his alleged supporters. Well, we all know John Buedu to have advised the Greater Accra Regional Minister to hold on to his bid to get Accra neat, clean, and in order because it will harm our votes. A minister is doing his job to transform Accra. You are thinking about votes. Now here is this person who came who came out, who came out to call Alan Tremartin to order, but has failed to call a Vice President Baumia to order for his alleged supporters who stormed the 2021 conference grounds in Kwasi. You see, we are having a repeat of what I said befell UGCC. And I must say something that I have no problem with that fine gentleman, uh, uh, what is called, Araji Baumia. The fact is that for the way things are going, people are beginning to speak ill of him, which shouldn't have been the case. He's a fine gentleman. But then, because of the party hierarchy, who have surrounded him and, and, and probably, allegedly, pushing people on to support him openly, but pressing down people and punishing them for supporting other candidates, like Alan Chamartin, like um, uh, Apoto Efriye, like Bwachia Jaakun, like uh, Aprepu, like uh, Jogate and Co. People will begin to feel that the vice president is using his office of the of his office to make sure that security agents go after these people. And you are doing harm to him. And one thing to leave his father out of this. Nobody should mention his father. I'm saying this because um, in the NDP, there are people who, who, who came over from the NDC. I can mention Boniface Sedi. I can mention Rashid Bawa. I can mention Francis Sesiem. Now, these people are doing great work in the party. We are not looking at their background. But immediately, you are doing these sort of things and promoting his father, who, incidentally, when he joined the MPP from the, when he joined the CPP from the Northern People's Party, started attacking uh, what they call it, the UP uh, leaders. Okay. To the extent that he even went to, to, to say that um, the French government paid one million pounds to Dr. Busia to say the coup. Just to mention and the father, because you say that will muddy the water. So let's stick with Mandela the Mandela issues Mandela. now. Let's not All go right. back to what his father did. All right. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. And I apologize to uh, Baumia for mentioning his father in this. Go ahead. But I'm saying nobody should mention his father or else people will bring out history mm. to destroy him. Okay. This is what I want to say. All right. Let Let's me br let me bring in Eric Osei. Eric Osei, okay, what would you. you describe as uh, a satisfactory behavior or conduct of the NPP executives? Is Eric on? Yes, I'm on. Eric, I'm saying that what would make you uh, satisfied as a member of the party? Uh, I mean, what kind of conduct are you expecting from your executives? that will make you satisfied. Right, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me now. Loud and clear. Sure, a lot has already been said with respect to the reality on the ground. So I wouldn't go back to retreat what the earlier speakers have said. 
but I am coming from a background. In 2020, some of us wanted to contest on the ticket uh, of NPP during primaries. I'm a long-standing member of the NPP. I've been a polling station executive for the past 14 years. I've been a regional communicator. I founded Unemployed Graduates Association. I founded Ghana Youth Watch, which campaigned in all the 10 regions of Ghana for the NPP and His Excellency Nana Redanko Ekufuado. I'm a young man, but I could use my money to do all these things for the party, just for the love of the party. I come from a, a, a particular tradition like uh, Mr. Dugan said, where my background is purely NPP, and I've been trained to be an NPP, and I've come to understand the ideals and principles of the party, and I've, I'm convinced within myself to follow the NPP. But unfortunately, when in 2020 I wanted to contest, there were lots of, let me say, mafia works, uh, I mean, undertaken by this current crop of national executives. I will, I will say that because I know regional executives works under national executives. There are instances where one person can buy four nomination forms, parliamentary nomination forms. One person. In my constituency, two people bought four forms because they felt Ima is a threat because Ima is very much uh, in tune with the young people within the constituency. So I wasn't given the opportunity to contest. That aside, there are lots of constituencies where uh, certain MPs were protected through fair or foul means to go unopposed and the lies. At the end of the day, when I look back and saw that the plight of my people is that of a miserable one, and so the constitution of Ghana gives rise to the fact that I, con I can contest independent, I decided to go. I went independent, had over 20,000 votes. The NPP candidate I contested, who is a minister, whose mother is a, a council of state member with all state apparatus supporting them. He also had 20,000, just as I had, just that he had a little over 20,000 to beat me to it. But what I'm saying is, sitting back and seeing what I was taking through when I wanted to contest primaries, and also observing that this is the same mafia where that they were, some, some group of people want to met on other presidential aspirants. I said, no, the party belongs to our forefathers. They sacrificed their life to bring the party into existence. You won't sit down and allow anybody take it as a personal property and use it any way he or she likes. Mm. So I also formed this Ashanti Patriots movement to, to, uh, to, to represent as a voice for the young people within this country. Okay. We won't sit down for people. You see, once it continues like that, it means you have to belong to a particular sect to mm. be able to, I mean, uh, have what it takes to do something to the benefit of the party. What so exactly, what, what exactly do decided. you want? What, do, what exactly do you want from the executives? What we want is for the ideals of the new patriotic party, uh, to be brought to bear equality if anybody who flouts um, any of the rules that the national council through the general secretary brought on 27 july let us see to how best we can apply the rules on everybody not that the uh, three guys from the northern region are light weighted so we can just flash them off the system and some grown up some mps some what have you have equally violated similar rules but they can be left to go that is what I am against. Let us do away with that. John Boydou, in his response to my press uh, statement, said, I went independent, and so I'm not a part. I, you see, I, I get marveled. In the 21st century, in a time like this, that knowledge is in abundance. Somebody who wants to break the eight, it is incumbent on you to uh, strategize in such a way that you can even get NBC members to fall for the MPP and vote for us. How much more... MPP members who went independent because of your, uh, your, your selfishness, greed, and what have you. It is for your inactions that there were lots of independent. They should even feel bad that under the Athena, in the history of Ghana, there hasn't been a time where independent candidates have been that many. It is under the Athena. And speaking against independent, I, I would like to even ask him, do we have majority in parliament? It's not an independent who is trying to give us majority. So how can you speak against independent? One year after elections, you don't see any need to bring together all independent candidates for us to see how best we can unite and rally all our supporters. Like I said, I had about 20,000 votes. Mm. Anybody, I'm not the only person who is forfeiting my uh, membership mm. because the, 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 the constitution says, if you say I forfeited my membership so I should step aside, it means you also step all my 
supporters are also stepping aside. Okay. How can you break the eight if you, if you go with this posture? Okay. It is as if they don't even understand what politics in this uh, contemporary times is about. Okay. Why I, here? I, I, we should have brought everybody on board and see how best. Right. I must say but, that we invited John Boydou, who is a general secretary, who has been accused of a number of things. He earlier agreed to be part of this conversation, but later pulled out. Um, I, I do not know his reason for pulling out, but... Um, uh, it's not a new thing in the MPP or any other political party that many people put themselves up for presidential candidate position. I mean, what is confusing right now is accusations of party executives favoring one side. We had same in the lead up to the 2020 elections and that angered a lot of members who ended up voting skirt and blouse and exactly what Eric has alluded to. Could the uh, the party, name is Emmanuel. Uh, Emmanuel. Okay, Sagan. Emmanuel. Emmanuel so, could the party man have managed this any better, uh, Dr. Asante? Um, when you look at uh, the turn of events, I have no doubt in my mind that MPP has a big, big, big problem. You see, Nkrumah said, and I put him there, that organization decides everything. Uh, within the party, they are not organized. We have to uh, say it bluntly. Yes, because if they are organized, then we want to see a uh, rule of law upheld. You see, democracy is anchored on the principle of rule of law, which has two components, equality before the law and due process, that everybody within the party is equal before the laws of the party. So if you begin to favor one group against the other, I'm afraid you are undermining internal democracy and even the democracy of the country itself. Due process, whatever decision you take within the party must resonate with the rules of the, the entire country. Is that what we are experiencing here? So it ties in uh, with the earlier position that they are not organized. They have a difficulty in organizing themselves. But there is something that they must take into consideration, that when we are talking about democracy, you should not put all your efforts on, you know, affirming the, the majoritarian minor a minority, uh, you know, divide. No. In a democracy, much as you want to support majority decision, you must not be oblivious of the fact that there is minority interest. So uh, somebody wants to contest. It doesn't matter how uh, very few supporters that he has. Uh, you must, you know, bring everybody on board and then you create that enabling environment that creates what equal platform for everybody. If people begin to all feel that they are not important within the party, then they begin to undermine the structures of the party. Uh, I can also see manipulation and deception, and uh, that is also a worrying sign, because this is a party that want to uh, maintain power after uh, two tenure, and uh, they need to rise above these things by you know manipulating the process to favor a particular candidate. Create that environment that it will be free for all to work contest. Whoever wins, he wins. And you, you all rally behind the person. But that's not what we also uh, forget the fact that, look, for you to be able to contest election and win massively in this country, it depends upon the work that you have done. It is uh, very, very important for them to know that, that if you don't have any record, any work that you have done that you can show, I'm afraid people are going to vote against you. Uh, even now, we are hearing a lot from the system that we haven't seen much from Nana Kufado's government. And uh, that is something that should occupy their attention so that whether it is true or not, at the end of the day, they must prove their metal and tell the public that, yes, this is what we have and we can show to the world. If they want to turn a blind eye on these things, I'm afraid they are going to have more tsunami uh, you know, shipping them away during the 2020 election. Uh, they need to also make sure that the party that they have voted, the country has voted for, and the government that is in power, you need to work and support the party. And then if you have any interest, you begin to what, manage it in such a way that it doesn't affect the government in power. Otherwise, what they are doing will be an exercise in futility. I want to be blunt to them. Mm. Dr. Ali said, what must give for sanity to prevail? Dr. Ali said, Yes, I think what must happen, first of all, 
is for the national executives of the party to seriously consider and investigate these claims and allegations that are being made across the, the country about uh, the level of unfairness in the one to the Fatih flag membership. We should not just dismiss them because when you have accumulated grievances, snowballing from the grassroots level to the national level, it is going to be a serious disaster for the party. And that will definitely not undermine internal unity and strength and cohesion, but it is going to make the party unattractive to the floating voters across the country. And we all know that the NPP alone cannot win elections by having just their supporters voting for them. You need the support of the floating voters and you need to some extent the support of some members of the NDC that you are able to convince. But if the house can, if the party cannot maintain its own internal democratic processes and unity and fairness, then it becomes very difficult for them to, to bring other people on board. So I think as a matter of agency, the national executives of the party should seriously look into the allegations that are being made and find a way to address them so that they can move forward as a united party rather than just dismiss them and say things that will even infuriate those who have genuine grievances and cannot even complain in the party. I think this should be taken seriously. And as a matter of fact, a committee must be set up to investigate these complaints and find a way to address them moving forward. Dr. Kobe Mensa, this bickering and seeming disunity certainly does not augur well for political communication as well as selling the party as the better option for the people. How dangerous or otherwise is this for the party's fortunes come 2024? Absolutely. I mean, if you cannot put your house together, uh, if you cannot make sure that you can maintain uh, law and order in your own party, how could you actually talk about, you know, uh, Kind of moving forward a country uh, which is in dire need economically socially so i think that it talks about the capacity in terms of leadership that the mpp has in order to lead this country i mean i'm, I'm sure that quite a lot of people are already disappointed and as, as uh, you know uh, my friend Asante actually pointed out i don't think majority of people are actually convinced that the mpp leadership currently has actually delivered i don't think that the nado's administration has delivered that's one conversation and then, of course, to add up to a conversation that internally your support base is in a bickering position, and that is actually spilling over to the entire country. That talks about your competence in terms of leadership. For me, I think that also the Constitution is failing. We see continuous failure of our Constitution. And I think the leadership in this country must start addressing themselves to this issue. Remember, we had President Rawlings and Akai incident where President Rawlings you know, wanted to eject Akar, but he couldn't because Akar was on the ticket as a, what do you call, a, 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 what do you call, a, the Rawlings and the Akar ticket. And as a result, he couldn't actually dispatch him. Now, if indeed we had a, a, a story, a rumor that Nanado had given ultimatum to those who have actually come out to say they're contestant six months, is it six months? To June to actually resign their position. What about the vice president? The vice president is on the ticket with Nanado. Now, the president cannot ask the vice president to resign because per constitution he was voted for. But that is an injustice here because if those who are actually, you know, uh, pitching themselves for elections, you know, should resign, which I agree because obviously you're going to have parallel structure. So definitely it will be in the interest of the administration to say, look, you either work for governance to continue, or if you want to actually fight for leadership, then you have to leave. I agree perfectly. But it becomes injustice because you cannot ask the vice president to actually resign, equally as you're asking the others to resign, which means that there's a constitution failure. So in the first instance where Rollins had issues with Akai, he couldn't sack. In this instance, of course, it seems to be that the president is actually perhaps, I don't know, but behind the, uh, the vice president may not be able to ask him because there's a constitutional provision that you cannot actually ask him to resign. And it means that we have an issue with our constitution. We have to actually have something to do with it. If a vice president midterm want to contest for leadership, which will be something that will be in, a, in conflict position with governance, and then of course it will give him an undue advantage. What does the constitution say? Must we be able to say that in that case, if you have an interest, 
you have to eject the government and you have to go and do your you know, party political, you know, uh, what do you call contest, or do we still keep you? We have to have those conversations. So definitely what is happening is telling a lot of voters that we have lost leadership. You know, we are not seeing the kind of leadership the Nado's administration said will provide the country because there's so much bickering in the governing party and there seem not to be any way of resolving it. At least the leadership of that party is not showing competence, it's not showing metal that they can deal with internal wranglings, let alone to deal with the issues that is going on in the country. Very, very you know, serious issues that we must consider. And Dr. Sassante, exactly what do you expect from the executives going forward? I believe that the executive must do self-introspection and see uh, to chart a clean path that people will begin to have what a renewed confidence within the party. And also the council of elders must wake up and rise up to the occasion. What, what are they doing? Because they can't sit down for people to disobey the rules that really are govern the whole political structure and then without calling people to order. They, that is the highest body within the party that can you know, call people to order and speak uh, to them in a manner that will really save uh, the image of the party. So I believe that all these things must be taken seriously. In addition to this, uh, the party must know that it is important for them to put their house in order. Otherwise, from political communication perspectives, all these things they are doing, uh, political communication scholars are picking bits and pieces, developing messages that will be churned against them during the electoral campaign. They must be very careful about this if they will really want to break the eight. And you cannot just say you want to break the eight without working. They need to leave a legacy, a legacy that they can stand on and campaign. If they don't have that, then it's going to be a tall order for them, so to speak. M Mr. Dugan, your colleague George Asante Corbia is asking for unity in the party with renewed hope, uh, renewed redirection to actually break the eight. For you, what will be satisfactory as a member of the party in terms of bringing everybody along to win power in 2024? Mr. Dugan, kindly unmute for me. Can you hear me now? Loud and clear. Thank you very much. Um, the only way for the MPP to break the eight is what my, my brother colleague just said. We need to come together. We need to move together. Everybody must be confident that Congress would elect someone who majority of the party loves. Uh, like to lead the party into 2024. So that if, let's say, I support a free year, Kuto, uh, sorry, Akuto, a free year, and um, any other person wins, I shouldn't be bothered. I should rather be happy that the party has got a winner. And nobody should be maligned, nobody should be ill treated, nobody should be harassed for taking a certain position. Because you see, um, I keep on asking this question. If let's say you are asked to choose between your father and your mother, who will you choose and for what reason will you choose that person? When you choose your father over your mother, it doesn't mean you hate your mother. When you choose your mother over your father, it doesn't mean you hate your father. But based on certain reasons, you decide that I'm choosing daddy or I'm choosing mommy. So anybody who supports any of the candidates should not be seen to be an enemy of the party. But unfortunately, that is what we are being educated by the national executive to, to believe. See, and this cannot make us break the eight. Because what happened, my brother uh, Samuel said something, what happened, the position of, um, of, of uh, MPs or nurses or using powers to make sure that certain people do not win the primaries was what caused us. I can say that in the constituency I reside in, a, uh, what do you call it? Our candidate lost, not because the NDC are voted, but the MPP rather voted against. 
because they weren't happy about the arrangements from, from head office, from national headquarters, and then from regional headquarters. So if you want to break the eight and set the record as the first political party to, to, to win three straight victories at the election, then we must come together. And, I, and this is the suggestion I'm going to make to the national executive. That is if they'll take it. Whatever the beautiful uh, code of conduct that, that they wrote, very beautiful code of conduct that they wrote, they themselves are not applying the code of conduct, um, 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 what they call it, genuinely. Let's put this in aside. Now let's say that, okay, you can campaign for any candidate of your choice, but do not, do not insult, do not castigate, do not say bad words against the candidate you don't support. This is going to help because whatever thing comes out from your mouth against that candidate, if that candidate is to win the primaries, the opposition will have enough ammunition to throw at him. Well, your party people said this, your party people said that. So that one, they should uh, forego it. And I'll plead with John Boydou to either come out clean, come out clean, or he should just keep quiet like the national chairman himself, we are not hearing his voice, to keep quiet, but work behind the scenes to rather unite the party than dividing the party as it seems he is doing now. Mm. Dr. Kobe Mensah, what should be the strategy? Because at the end of the day, the NPP wants to put itself up for a win and not to fail. I want to believe that. Yeah, I think that uh, just like uh, Mr. Dugan actually you know, talked about, I think there must be a meeting between the interested stakeholders, you know, because uh, clearly this is getting, you know, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, overboard. It's actually uh, uh, escalated. I think, firstly, the, the party executive must call the stakeholders and then, you know, perhaps put out a very, you know, clear message of, you know, decency. How do you ensure that you can actually go about your campaign without necessarily causing you know, damage, you know, reputational damage to the political party in case one of them wins. So once you, you actually call for that truce, you call for that engagement, you put the rules you know, you know, on the table, and then you make sure that people would come to terms that, yes, the rules will be applied equally. I am sure people would actually respect that. And as some of my colleagues have already said, I think the national executives plus uh, what we call the Council of Elders must also come together to sort of come out with the rules and regulations that will be favorable to everybody else. Because currently, as it's going, the bickering that's going on is not helping them at all uh, because it's actually denigrating their image as due process, their image as the party that is the most organized, which they always tout themselves as such. Certainly, it's not going down that way. Now, the president must be clear, you know, on his stance. Now, clearly, he cannot do anything to the vice president if he actually campaigns because the constitution, you know, says so. You cannot actually push the vice president out. But I think that when people hear you say, you know, for those who have expressed interest, uh, they must resign, and that rule does not apply to the vice president, people who do not understand the constitutionality of it is going to actually question the fairness of that. And I, I think that has to be communicated because people wouldn't actually take it lightly that why would you ask these people to resign but not the vice president? That communication must be clear so that people would understand it's a constitutional issue but not a deliberation by the, by the president. But I think the key strategy is to call for truth. I think the party organs the stakeholders in terms of the, you know, the, uh, uh, the Council of Elders, the national uh, executives, the various interest groups in terms of the candidates who want to contest, must come together to pull together a very you know, formalized, a very structured rules and regulations that actually favors almost everybody, and then push it together. That would bring some kind of unity. And as Mr. Dugan said, if everyone sees that the rules are being applied you know, clearly and fairly. I think that it wouldn't be difficult to bring the party together post the leadership contest, regardless of who wins or who loses. But if you do not do that, that is where you have a problem where the party is likely to be split and you're gonna have an issue on your hand 
going into the 2024 elections. Mm. Dr. Ali Risedo, you call for a committee to uh, ascertain the truth in all the allegations that is being made against the executives. How urgent is this? I mean, how early should this happen? Is Dr. Ali to say today? I think Ali is not on the call. Oh, okay. So we lost Dr. Ali to say. I would like to throw that to you, Dr. Sasanti. Then, how early should this happen? Can you unmute for me, Dr. Sasanti? Yeah, I think time is not on the side of the NPP. They need to work and work very fast and make sure that. Uh, they get all these uh, problems addressed quickly, quickly. They need to do that. And I also see that there's a problem with their institutions, you know. Now, it appears to me that the institutions that they have built, that has really stood the test of time, is crumbling. They need to work on their institution. By institution, I'm talking about the procedures, the processes, the norms, the rules, and all that. They need to make sure that these things work and work. And how do you make them work. You need to enforce the rule rigidly, without fear, without favor. You know, uh, that is very, very critical. And they should also not push the party uh, to the position that, where people can describe it as electoral machinery. That yes, they are not thinking about how to govern the state and provide the needs of the people who uh, really give them their mandate in 2000, uh, in 2020. But they should be able to what, work and support the people so that out of that, the people can also re reciprocate by giving them what their mandate come 2024 20, elections. But if they want to turn it into electoral machinery, I'm afraid they are going to destroy the party tradition in no time because then people will not trust them. They will believe that as for these people, they only want power. Once they get power, every time you put them into office, they just work for Power, power, power. They will not fight for the ordinary man in the city. And that will have a boomerang effect in their political fortunes. Mm. I'm grateful for your time. Uh, Dr. Asasante is political science lecturer in uh, the Department of Political Science at the University of Ghana. And he's also director of the Center for European Studies. Christian Daniel Dugan is former deputy minister for fisheries and the Kufo administration. And uh, Dr. Kobi Mensah is political communication strategist with the University of Ghana Business School. And Dr. Ali Duseidu also joined us. He's senior lecturer at the Department of Political Science. Uh, at the University of Ghana, and Emmanuel Osei, also a member of the NPP, and uh, um, convener for the Asante Patriots Movement. I'm extremely grateful that all of you joined the conversation. Let's take a break on the polls. We'll bring you more on this.